So this is about Occidentalism, which is directly related to Orientalism. Now, you might think that if Orientalism was kind of a derogatory attitude towards the Orient, then Occidentalism is clearly and obviously a derogatory attitude towards the Occident, which is the old British way of saying the West, right? the Occident and the Orient. But it's not. It's actually two sides of the same coin. If the European societies looked down their noses and uh, felt that uh, Asians were inferior, fundamentally, genetically, socially, culturally inferior, then uh, Occidentalism is a phenomenon that is in a way the same thing but going in the other direction. It is the inferiority complex of the Orient directed back at the Occident. I brought some books. That, that one. Here's one. It's called Occidentalism. Maybe I'll find a reading in this book, since the title matches. And Ian Baruma is a fantastic writer. So um, there's also this one called Indigenous Modernities, which uh, could work. Um, and I also wanted to show you Hassan Udin Khan's uh, edited volume on Chandigarh. I think this is in the library. And I wrote a review of this uh, that you might be able to find on the internet. Um, but it, it's got some great, it's very uneven, but it does have some excellent things in it if you're interested in Chandigarh. Um, but Occidentalism is this very odd self, uh, self-esteem problem of the former colonized uh, places in the world. And this is what Abedin Kusno was referring to in the last reading, is this sense of inferiority, the, in, the, the uh, lasting inferiority complex of the rest of the world, where McDonald's is seen somehow as a sign of progress um, in these places. Um, and progress uh, is a word that is connected with modernization, urbanization, uh, and it is somehow the, the fundamental presumption of all of mankind that we started in as amoeba crawling in, in the pools. We developed feet and came onto land. We were monkeys and then we became humans. There's something about this progression, this idea of a progression uh, moving forward in time and constant progress and then within our own society in North America, constant growth. It's all about progress and growth. And everything is based on progress and growth. As a matter of fact, your ability to finance your education is based on uh, progress and growth. Your ability of your parents to put a second mortgage on their house and keep you from uh, taking out too many loans, which is the way most of us finance our children's education, is based on progress and growth. The, the core assumption is our housing will always be worth more in 10 years than it's worth today. The cities we've been looking at, Pudong, Dubai, they're the financing of those cities, way beyond any reasonable, rational demand for, for the housing or the infrastructure of these places, is based on the story, being able to tell the story with some credibility, that 20 years from now, the value of these towers in Dubai and Pudong and Shanghai will be higher than they are now. And it's based on that story, the viability of that story, that things will be worth more in the future, that we borrow money in the present to pay for things like this class, and to pay for things like subway systems, and to pay for things like uh, whatever, a new dormitory on Huntington Avenue. Everything is based on the myth of growth. Uh, and I say myth because sometimes it's true, sometimes it's not true. Now, there is another word we've been using all semester that is very closely related to the word story, and that is culture. Culture, at its core, is a shared story. We are of a common culture to the extent that we share a story. 
And part of the ingredients of storytelling in, our, in every society is, uh, are the cultural manifestations of our collective story. This is a very clear example of a collective uh, story here in Indonesia, which might help us understand how collective stories work in our own lives. This collective story started with the bloody coup, and the massacre of somewhere between half a million and a million people, uh, and the rise of General Suharto to becoming president uh, between 1965 and 1966, which was the time of the communist purge. He came in as a brutal dictator, killing as many as a million people, and he quickly consolidated his power by converting that power from the threat of death to the promise of development. And so within the course of the first 10 years of his 32-year dictatorship, he uh, delivered on his promise. He changed the story that he was telling. And his story was, we are no longer going to indulge the extravagance, the personal extravagance of the megalomaniacal architect Sukarno, Ar architect president Sukarno. We are going to not just build mega projects in the capital city of Jakarta. We are going to spread the wealth and the benefit of modern progress to all the populated islands of the archipelago out into the far reaches of the nation of Indonesia. And uh, Su Suharto, the man here, uh, was a farmer, and he wanted uh, to benef bring benefits to a majority of the population of the country who were and are still farmers. And so he brought electricity, he brought television to every village. Every village got a television, and they could watch the evening national news that was a very powerful instrument for telling the collective story of the nation state of Indonesia. So the first and clearest mega project of Suharto's presidency was the mega project of bringing electricity and television to every village. And television was a mandatory activity that was enforced uh, by the village heads. And it was important to get the story out uh, that was told every night on the national controlled news. Uh, and billboards and architecture was part of the telling of that story. Uh, this is a picture of the main street of Jakarta uh, back in the 1980s. Uh, it has all the things we like to see in modern, in symbols of modern progress. A wide boulevard choked with, with expensive automobiles, uh, glass and steel towers with no regard, almost no regard for uh, the cost of air conditioning. Uh, it's got everything we like to symbolize progress. Um, and the old neighborhoods that look something like this uh, were quickly giving away, giving way um, in progression um, from low, you know, one and two story uh, houses to these concrete frame buildings uh, at the top of the image going up to four or five stories. These are called uh, ruko. What does that mean? Rukun rumatoko. So house store, there's shop houses, basically directly uh, developing out of the Lilong house, the shop house that Nan told us about uh, two weeks ago in his guest lecture. And then moving from that scale to this scale, the uh, postmodern aesthetic of steel and glass uh, image clad uh, towers uh, built, growing out of these uh, these low-rise neighborhoods. And this is actually quite a nice neighborhood of uh, Bendong Hillier, uh, Ben Hill. I don't know if you've been there, Paul. It's very centrally located. It's right downtown. Um, quite a nice neighborhood. Uh, very mixed of rich and poor. You can see a mosque in the lower right by the chrome dome on the Javanese pyramid roof. Uh, and so looking at the edges, you kind of get a sense of how this development might take place. This looks a little bit like the Parasopolis uh, spiral building with the swimming pools on each balcony. Um, the abruptness of the shift 
There's a reason why these abrupt shifts happen, is that these neighborhoods are easier to dispossess than other neighborhoods. And so uh, these mega projects, uh, condo complexes, grow out of the poorest neighborhoods because the poorest neighborhoods are the ones that are easiest to accumulate the land for such projects. And so you get this bizarre mosaic of uh, low-rise, uh, simple housing left over from uh, the post-independence period to the far left. Then the urban freeway is cut through, and then along the urban freeway we build our tall buildings um, and keep building them along that infrastructure. And that's kind of the way things progress in cities all over the world. Even right downtown, and you see in the upper left-hand corner, the National Monument of Sukarno at the center of Jakarta, the symbolic center of Jakarta. Uh, and you see uh, the persistent neighborhoods of the poor just waiting to be demolished uh, to make way for further development. And in the 1980s, you see the bank, the deregulation of the banks allowed this to happen. Paul Rudolph uh, brought in a signature building, uh, trying to make an indigenous expression of critical regionalism, trying to shade the windows and bring an element of sustainability to it. Um, but basically, this is the story you get. Uh, this is a very interesting phenomenon uh, that I've given several examples of. But here you have the restaurant Payon that contests that it is offering authentic Indonesian uh, food and goods. But the weird thing is that this restaurant is in, uh, it's in Kamang. Have you been there? Is it good? Oh, delicious. Yeah? Yeah. Is it where you, near where you live? Do you live near? Uh, like an hour away. Okay. So about uh, six miles? <laughs> so, um, so I've eaten here. Um, this is right near my friend's house where I always stay. Uh, but it's very strange to have everything in the whole place be an Indonesian uh, or some other local dialect. And yet here's one uh, that breaks the rules and has its uh, subtitle in English. And it's claiming to be authentic Indonesian food. It's bizarre, because surrounding this is authentic Indonesian food that doesn't declare itself to be authentic Indonesian food. I mean, there's also chem chicks and all the other what catering to Western tastes. Yeah, the surrounding area is like one of the more densely white. Yes, yes, but it's very strange, you know, to have. It's a very strange kind of ironic uh, twist to reality. Continuing the lecture. Looking at the city of Jakarta, uh, it started out as a unimportant fishing village on the northwest coast of the island of Java. It was never a central piece of the larger cultural economic activity of Java until uh, Dutch colonial uh, forces came into play. They, the Dutch came in and in competition with the Portuguese and the British, they basically said this is an excellent port from which we can establish our dominance, uh, military dominance over the Muslim traders, the Portuguese, and the British. So it was fairly um, fortified uh, in a replica of the, uh, the Dutch cities of um, Amsterdam and other port cities. So it was surrounded by a wall. It was uh, a canal city. And it was very much uh, a Dutch city. And as, as a matter of fact, the local indigenous population was not allowed to live inside the walls of this fortress town. At the same time, there were not many Dutch citizens willing to uh, live in this town as well. So it was really uh, right from the start uh, in the 16th century, an international port town. Uh, filled with Chinese, Malays, uh, Indians from all over the world, from every part of the vast Dutch uh, trading uh, empire. The, the network of trade touched in Africa, South America, everywhere across the world. And those were the people who lived in this town. 
And so they were very diverse and they were ethnically identified and had different rights uh, based on their ethnicity, just like apartheid South Africa. Uh, and so it started out uh, as a very small, narrow, narrowly spatially defined port city with indigenous population living uh, in the fields outside the walls, um, where you can see here they were not allowed into the city except under strict controls. Uh, and from there it expanded quite uh, regularly over the centuries. And the data is much more complete in our more recent uh, times, uh, and so we get more data points uh, in the last 50 years, especially in the 70s when these maps were published. And so you have very rapid growth after World War II uh, and independence when all of the planning and zoning and parcel regulation of the Dutch colonial time, um, the spaces between houses fill in, and so you get this type of a progression. Uh, and we can see it uh, in this comparison from on the far left in the 1970s, uh, in the middle in the 1980s, and uh, to the far right in the 21st century. Um, this is not a very useful map, but uh, the maps of Jakarta are, of, are not very well developed yet. So if any of you wish to look at Jakarta, that would be great. Um, the typical slum housing, this is a very recently settled slum, and it's like informal settlements all over the world. Uh, it starts out with extremely poor conditions, uh, bad access to everything, especially uh, fresh water, sanitation, uh, roads, uh, phones, communication. But over time, uh, these settlements, as people's prospects actually improve, they build better housing, they establish uh, greater controls. They, uh, and in Indonesia, one of the great examples uh, of local self-development, uh, of local associations uh, from over the centuries, traditions of social organization that help the physical transformation of these neighborhoods from abject uh, slums to uh, more established towns to something quite reasonable uh, in terms of uh, urban um, formal. It, it passes the test of many of the um, formal settlements. Although it still has the appearance of cacophony, there are still weaknesses in the infrastructure uh, that is difficult to retrofit uh, after the fact of its settlement. However, Indonesia, starting with the Dutch, and then after independence, have a, a very successful example in the Kampung Improvement Program, where the government supplies uh, the raw materials, they dump it at the gateway to the neighborhood, and then the local labor force takes over, and they, uh, they define the tra drainage trenches underneath every walkway, and create a, a, a drainage system that is also the sanitation system, unfortunately, uh, for many of these neighborhoods. Uh, but it reduces the flooding, it reduces the health hazards, and it creates uh, concrete walkways uh, in and out of the uh, districts, and uh, life gets better. And it's very low cost, very high impact, and an excellent model for slum improvement uh, globally. Um, the more traditional method is to replace and, rem and move people out of those uh, kampungs into formal housing. And these are parceled, um, designed, uh, industrially produced, uh, in, but usually outside of town. And so the accommodation uh, through wider streets of the automobile uh, has a very direct correlation to increasing automobilization of the society, uh, which is something we'll get into in a bit. Um, in the 1970s, with, in the face of such dramatic and rapid growth, the Dutch uh, reacquainted themselves with their formal uh, colonized uh, society, um, this time apologizing and offering help. And 
the Dutch planners had developed their own model for the Netherlands based on extremely tight controls of the land, which was not something that was possible in Indonesia. The, the control of land, uh, the regulations, the rule of law is a much weaker institution in Indonesia at that time. And so they develop an idea that by supplying infrastructure uh, along an east-west corridor uh, on the left in the linear paradigm, they can uh, reduce the development pressures in the uh, space uh, outside of those corridors. And it was fundamentally a rail system. And so primary uh, infrastructure being rail, water supply, sanitation, electrical grids, all of that uh, operating in an east-west direction, primarily with a secondary axis in the north-south, they could control growth and concentrate it along these corridors. And this was the paradigm that was strongly favored by everyone in the in the 1970s, uh, as opposed to uh, a more British-based uh, approach of the concentric circles of ring roads and green belts to try to uh, produce um, satellite cities along a green belt ring road uh, set of infrastructure with radial, um, uh, a ring and radial uh, combination system. And comparing these two approaches, uh, the Dutch and Indonesians reached a very strong and clear consensus that the linear paradigm was superior in every possible way to the concentric paradigm. And so that was the basis of the planning uh, thinking in the 1970s. But something happened uh, along the way. Um, in the 1980s and 90s, the exercise is repeated um, with slight variations, and each time they uh, create uh, a similar, uh, come to a similar conclusion that the linear paradigm is superior to the finger city or the self-sustaining new towns around concentric um, patterns. Now, in the first chapter of all of the planning reports, they reaffirm the linear city model, but then as soon as they move on to the implementation of this, they, um, they def default directly to the ring road model. And this is in part due to the uh, increasing influence of American models of urban development and consumption and housing and automobilization. And, uh, but it's not just American cultural influence, it is also the alignment of these uh, North American models with uh, the mechanisms of accumulation of wealth and power. And so that's what the rest of this is going to look at, is this uh, joining together of the cultural paradigms of these housing and infrastructure patterns out of North America uh, and the alignment of those with the accumulation of power. The most clear thing is perhaps the fact that President Suharto's family uh, went into the business of toll road construction. And so the development of toll roads became a basis of a uh, very important accumulation of wealth to the children of the president. Uh, and so you see ring road upon ring road upon ring road, and um, these um, most of these have been built at this point. Um, representing uh, the next complementary element, we have uh, Dick and Rimmer's uh, illustration of the size of what we are what are referred to as new towns. Although the word town has to be taken loosely, because most of these are simply house what we would call housing subdivisions, but m on a massive scale and representing this a little bit more accurately spatially, we get some of the largest and most important housing developments um, showing up on this map, uh, uh, my interpretation of the same data, of um, what they, but using their term new towns, uh, which should appear in quotes. Um, now, this has a severe impact on the transportation system. These uh, bicycle taxis all, or also called Bechak, were banned in Jakarta. And they weren't just banned uh, in a usual bureaucratic way. They were banned in a highly theatrical way, where police raids 
of Baychak garages uh, yielded hundreds of these vehicles that were uh, with, uh, to the great uh, delight of government officials, uh, filmed with video cameras as the um, police took these Baychaks to the ocean and dumped them in. Uh, they are largely replaced with motorized versions uh, produced in India called Bajais, uh, Tuk Tuk in Bangkok, uh, and you see these throughout um, South Asia and Southeast Asia. Um, and they still have uh, sellers because it's so difficult, because of the separation, the segregation of housing and markets, uh, these remain a very important way uh, to conduct business and a very important uh, resource or economic activity um, for a lot of the people who live in the informal Kampong settlements uh, of Indonesia. Um, now, uh, these types of scenes in the 1970s were proudly uh, displayed on the brochures of uh, literature promoting Jakarta as an advanced place as if to say look how modern we are we even have traffic jams on our new toll roads uh, but since it has become uh, one of the most significant uh, limitations on economic growth and development of the nation of Indonesia and it's become quite oppressive um, and this despite the fact that a vast majority of Indonesians even a majority of Jakartans do not have access to an automobile even today. That um, uh, this is still a very expensive way to move about. It takes up a lot of space. It requires um, a different housing arrangement. It requires a very different arrangement of downtowns uh, because of the limitations on parking. And so despite these huge increases, um, it remains uh, the transportation mode of a minority of uh, Indonesians. And yet, at the same time, uh, it has created a very, uh, has become acknowledged as the single biggest uh, detriment and uh, hazard of uh, the society. Um, the, because of the climate and the economic situation, motorbikes, as you can see here, what we would call motorbikes, uh, 400cc Chinese uh, produced um, small motorbikes. Um, to address it in the 90s, uh, they developed a three-in-one policy for the downtown area that unless uh, you have three passengers in your car, you cannot enter uh, the downtown area. Uh, this led to the um, emergence of jockeys, uh, young boys who for a dollar or two will ride in your car with you so you can enter. And then subsequently, based on the inspiration of uh, Latin American models, uh, the bus rapid transit system um, was introduced um, uh, by a, a governor who basically forced it upon everyone else and it, to very mixed reviews. Um, very unpopular for some reason um, that we could go into. Um, but even with the expansion of the bus system, there's an open hostility to, uh, to pedestrians. And after the riots in 1998, uh, building complexes were walled off, entrances uh, for pedestrians were closed because protesters don't drive to protests. They walk to protests. And so walkers all became uh, suspect. Um, even where the sign says it is forbidden to walk in the the bus travel lane, uh, for many uh, because so many of the pedestrian entrances were closed and difficult to reach, that there's really no other way to get to this bus terminal. Um, very interesting. Um, here we see again Dick and Rimmer's uh, diagram of the uh, traditional segregation of uh, housing and economic activities uh, around the traditional, uh, as of the post-war period, uh, the suburbanization of cities around the world, uh, you still have segregation of residential and um, economic and recreational activities around the ring, around the center. Uh, and so you have the first wave of development is the symbolic rising of the 
of the skyline. This is an I am pay building, a, 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 a copy, a knockoff of a building produced um, in Germany and in Vancouver, um, here produced for an Indonesian audience. Taman Anggrek um, shopping mall, um, a, se a series of shopping malls, each one larger than the last, uh, demonstrating the cannibalistic tendency of capitalism for each new thing to kill off uh, the last generation or uh, the, the production two generations ago, um, becoming very popular hangouts uh, for youth, uh, whether they buy something or not, thus the need for security guards to discourage such activities um, so that shoppers uh, don't feel harassed. Um, the ice skating rink uh, in on the equator, uh, and then Dick and Rimmer's um, diagram of the bundled uh, situation, where instead of uh, requiring people to still drive long distances from their luxury housing to their luxury offices and luxury consumption points, uh, they bundle them together, and uh, in developments like this, where there is a a, a combination of the imagery of luxury villa housing, um, what is called real estate. Uh, real estate is a very strange thing. Uh, it's a familiar term that was adopted by Indonesia, but it was brought to Indonesia in the 1970s, um, prior to which there was no such thing as real estate. There was buying and selling of houses, but it was not called real estate. The word real estate in this setting refers specifically to large subdivisions. Um, and so the new model of real estate is to combine the imagery of the uh, two-story single-family house villa and the modern skyline in a single place. Um, and throwing golf in, why not? Uh, and so we have um, even in the most primitive uh, representations, we have the combination of high-rise uh, commerce and low-rise housing. And this triggers uh, something, uh, the expansion of Jakarta out to um, the surrounding province of West Java. Uh, and so we don't call it Jakarta anymore. We call it Jabo de Tabek, which is uh, not an acronym. It's a compression of the word Jakarta, Bogor, Tangerang, uh, Bekasi, and Depok, so Jabo de Tabek, the DE was added, Depok was added um, more recently. And you see um, this uh, very sensitive landscape of preserved uh, land, might show it better in the next image. So here we have um, the, the problems of Jakarta, uh, the biggest single problem is traffic, but shortly behind that are the problems of flooding. And uh, related to the flooding problem is the uh, subsidence of the land as water, as fresh water is pumped out of uh, aquifers, the land actually sinks. In some neighborhoods, the land has sunk uh, about a meter, which makes flooding much more serious. Um, the other factor of flooding is development um, to the south of the city on the steep slopes of the, um, the uh, forests has led to deforestation, uh, the reduction of agricultural land and replacement by uh, large uh, housing, suburban housing subdivisions, uh, which has increased the runoff, uh, the velocity of the water, the ferocity of the water, the volume of the water, uh, draining northward into the basin uh, the low-lying basin of Jakarta has caused uh, flooding that every year gets worse and worse. And, in, um, and so uh, the, the strategy for reducing this hazard has been to preserve the agricultural land along the coast um, and to preserve the upland uh, forests and agricultural land uh, to the south of the city. Um, but the new town development has grown uh, despite these uh, efforts, or at least the talking about these efforts. Um, this is an interesting novel uh, development um, 
called Lippo Karawachi, where they built skyscrapers in order to uh, establish a big city uh, image uh, for their selling, basically for the selling of housing. That the big city image uh, doesn't really generate income in and of itself, but it does help to sell the housing, which is where the, the money is truly made. And um, it's not without its uh, efforts. The Indonesia passed one of the most progressive uh, housing laws uh, ever, uh, saying that every time you build a luxury house, for every one luxury house, you have to build nine low and middle income houses, um, uh, six of them being low income houses, which is what you're seeing here uh, being developed. These low income houses are so small, uh, about 200, between 200 and 300 square feet, um, which is about half the size of our classroom, um, about the size of uh, 209. Um, the, they're so small that they're difficult to photograph, uh, and so I had to photograph it this way, under construction. Um, in the meantime, those, uh, the luxury housing We'll always have two kitchens. One looks like your kitchen uh, or something, some replica of a Western kitchen. Uh, and off the, the screen to the right is the doorway to the kitchen where the food is actually cooked by servants. This is merely for snacks for the, um, the wealthy owners of the house um, to get after school or something. And the servants, the uh, three or four servants per household, really don't have access to this kitchen except to keep it clean. The real kitchen where all the wonderful food gets produced is too small and dark to take a photograph of, but it's basically a windowless concrete floor room off to the right with um, a propane stove, uh, maybe up on a concrete ledge, um, but everything is cooked. Uh, often it's cooked squatting at the floor level uh, and um, amazing things come out of very small kitchens and this kitchen is the show kitchen so there's two kitchens uh, in these houses um, and the show kitchen and the real kitchen I guess this is attempting to show um, the real kitchen off to the left um, barely visible uh, the other thing that is strange is that uh, this housing complex uh, in central Java has been uh, sold. Uh, every single house in this complex is owned by someone. Uh, and there are people living here, but the people living here are servants. They are hired to live in the house to keep the bathroom fixtures from being stolen by, by thieves uh, and the copper plumbing pipes to be stolen. Uh, they are basically occupying these houses to preserve their value uh, and when the children, their three-year-old daughter is ready to get married in 20 years, they will sell one or two of these houses um, that will hopefully grow in value. One of the few things shown to grow in value in Indonesia uh, because they don't have uh, the same uh, money market funds and stock markets and uh, the, the stable investments have been uh, in the last few decades the houses and so People buy houses not to live in them, not to rent them out, but just to um, park their money and hold value for the future. And so uh, basically this is a, a version of the ghost city, except there are lots of people hired to live in here in these houses to keep them maintained and maintain their value. Here's um, my architect friend uh, who is very proud of his ability to uh, interpret the history of architecture of Europe and um, interpret it uh, as housing for Indonesians. And so we see these remarkable creative uh, adaptations of uh, Western historical costumes applied to the uh, housing patterns that ostensibly look like Western floor plans, but uh, are adapted to Indonesian Javanese lifestyles. Uh, and sometimes they can get quite fanciful, fanciful and cartoonish. Um, this is a model of an actual housing development, very small houses uh, that will be 
developed um, uh, in this manner where you choose a different style for a different neighborhood. So uh, there, every, all the floor plans are the same, but the, uh, the costumes are different. And you can choose from classic, modern, European, Mediterranean, um, different styles. Uh, whatever you want, you can have it. Um, and here's an example of a Mediterranean style. Uh, they say Mediterranean, the naming schemes, uh, they use words like Siena and Barcelona, um, Southern European um, uh, location names, but really this is uh, directly out of uh, the Southern California playbook, and that's something that will be developed more extensively in the reading. Um, an interesting thing that happens during the 80s and 90s is the uh, rapid expansion, uh, the claiming of land, the uh, development, or at least the planning, of vast uh, subdivisions um, around the city of Jakarta um, in land, covering land areas uh, that are larger than the city itself. And these are basically get-rich-quick schemes um, of land speculation that has really nothing to do with demand for this type of housing. It's just a very rapid way to make money through loans and land controls, uh, etc., including the largest yellow area you see here, which uh, was developed by one of Suharto's sons. Um, and the land, this vast area of land, was available to him because it was a, a uh, a sanctuary, uh, a nature preserve, um, partly established in order to control the flooding and reduce the flooding in Jakarta. Uh, so this nature preserve was off limits to development uh, unless you are the president's son. Um, so here we have a replica of London um, from uh, an industrial 19th century time, but with greater parking. And we have um, the a zero lot line model um, just pulled out of its zero lot line situation and put on a cul-de-sac. But there's still a party wall on either side of each of these houses. Very strange architectural um, manipulation of uh, a, a morphology, a, a housing type. Um, and you see in the brochures these images of skyscrapers mixed with parkland and um, luxury housing off in the distance. You have uh, references to uh, American culture, uh, Southern California, Rodeo Drive. Um, it says America welcome, but it also says uh, it is forbidden to sell uh, things in this area, trying to keep away the uh, itinerant uh, carts of selling, uh, selling things uh, at the edge of the parking lot. And you have whole housing developments that announce at the entrance, this is American style housing, or this is the Montana um, model. Uh, love the horse. Um, this is uh, Roman, and here we have um, the Colosseum. But wait, no, it's it's Athens. It's uh, the Acropolis inside the Colosseum. So it's a very strange juxtaposition. The Duomo of Florence comes in. Um, the Indonesian architectural schools teach the same history of architecture that, that we get uh, in North America. And so uh, we study uh, all over the world. We study the same handful of monuments of the Renaissance, uh, the industrial era, and the modern era and then they become available for redeployment in real estate developments. Here, you don't even need to uh, build it. Uh, you can do everything in Photoshop down to the people. Um, believe it or not, this is an advertisement for an actual housing development uh, outside of Jakarta. Um, back to uh, Paris. Uh, these are gatehouses where guards uh, allow people in or not, uh, depending on if they live there or, in my case, if they are white. Um, and Dutch, even Japan gets into the action um, because it is a highly developed uh, culture and society and thus available for cartoon representations. 
and um, there seems to be a competition, a one-upsmanship, whoever can uh, more closely replicate these icons of the West uh, wins. Uh, why not um, the pharaohs? Um, very interesting uh, interpretations. And the craftsmanship, um, it, it, it wears out quickly in, in the tropical weather. Um, the last example is something that unabashedly refers directly to Southern California. This is the first town in that large area of yellow uh, developed uh, called Jongol, developed by Suharto's son, proposed by Suharto's son, uh, about two hours uh, to the southeast of Jakarta. And uh, in order to develop this, uh, he went directly to Southern California to Orange County to Irvine Ranch and hired the transportation planner and the uh, the housing developer uh, for Irvine Ranch uh, in order to plan his replica of Irvine Ranch in Jakarta. And so uh, they assumed they didn't have data on uh, how many vehicles um, are associated with households in Indonesia, so they used the Southern California numbers to generate the traffic uh, patterns and uh, the volume uh, calculations for the roadways. And uh, they uh, laid out um, the town uh, under the conditions, presuming that it was going to be just like Southern California. When the planners said, well, um, when can we visit? Um, the Suharto son said, um, oh, no need to visit. Uh, you just give us drawings right from Southern California, and we'll make it work. Um, so a very interesting direct application of uh, an Occidental attitude to, uh, to Indonesia.